In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, welcome to each and every one of you who are joining us for our online service in the chapel of St. John's United Church in downtown Moncton. For those of you celebrating Happy Mother's Day, and for those of you who find this to be a hard day, our prayers are with you. Just a few announcements. To help us in our ministry, we would ask that you notify the church if you would like to join our email list. And on our email list, we send out the prayers and hymns for this service, as well as pastoral letters once a week and any other pertinent information we think the congregation should have. Also, you can let us know by phone or by email the names of students in our church who are graduating this year from university, college, or high school who, are, who we'd like to recognize. Doing this helps us stay connected as a congregation in this day and age when it's hard to do that. So we thank you for your help in advance. Our pastoral care committee has phoned 138 households in the month of April. Well done to everybody who is helping with that ministry. Also, for those who are interested, we have posted our financial statements on our website, and there you'll find details to questions you might have about how we're doing as a congregation at present through this crisis. To date, we have given over $6,000 to the Mission and Service Fund of the United Church of Canada, and we're very proud of that work. Also, in this announcement time, we'd like to congratulate our very own Everett Patterson, who was named a recipient of two prestigious awards at Mount Allison University's virtual 2020 last lecture. Well done, Everett. We're always proud of you. As we have learned from the province of New Brunswick, large gatherings of people are still not permitted as we continue to live into this era of the coronavirus. There are no dates given for when we'll be able to do that. That being said, I'm very grateful to have so many of you join us here each week, and it is encouraging to know that the message of good news is reaching you in your homes or wherever it is that you're watching this service. I invite you now to our call to worship. Thomas shares our doubt. He doesn't know what will come next. We do not know where we are going. How can we know the way? Christ calls us to remember. We do not know what God is doing, but we know who Christ is, so we know God is too. We have known God and have seen God. Philip pushes against the new normal. He leans into what he knew before everything changed. We have done the same. Show us what God can do. Christ soothes our troubled hearts and invites us to believe. I am in you and you are in me. Let us find a way into this truth. Let us worship God together. Let us pray. Ever gracious, way-making God, we celebrate the gifts of your spirit. You have not fed us a diet of shame or shrinking, but with the milk of your truth. You have made us strong and faithful servants of Christ. You call us to take up the mantle of justice and to follow wherever faith leads us. You fill us with strength and hope, and you invite us to share in the cost and joys of discipleship. You promise us splendor and beauty in this life and in the world to come. Meet us here, we pray, that your word will be fulfilled in our hearing and that your spirit will fill us with courage. Amen. And let us now in this moment take a, just a few seconds of quiet as we prepare our hearts for confession. Let us pray. Ever gracious God, from generation to generation, you call forth faithful women and men to be willing servants of truth. You fill us with strength and hope, yet we find it is often not enough. We pray for... We pray both for great faith and for easy lives, but we know these things seldom exist together. We pray only to avoid the time of trial, 
when we need also to pray for strength and confidence to face the challenges that come with faithfulness. Forgive us, God, for our limited vision and our feeble trust. Make us strong so that we may rejoice in your unending grace, even in times of deepest suffering. In Christ we pray. Amen. Blessed be God, the giver of life, and blessed be God's people who rejoice in Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. Our opening hymn will be Spirit of Gentleness, as sung by Roland Gallant, Kathy, Tom Moynihan, and Susan Reed, who are taking part together in the Two Household Bubble here in New Brunswick, and it was a joy to see them singing together. Spirit, Spirit of gentleness, blow through the wilderness, calling and free. Spirit, Spirit of restlessness, stir me from placidness, wind, wind on the sea. You moved on the waters, you called to the deep. Then you coaxed up the mountains from the valleys of sleep. And over the eons you called to each thing. Wake from your slumbers and rise on your wings. You swept through the desert, you stung with the sand, and you goaded your people with the law and the land. And when they were blinded with their idols and lies, then you spoke through your prophets to open their eyes. You sang in a stable, you cried from a hill, then you whispered in silence when the whole world was still. And down in the city you called once again when you blew through your people on the rush of the wind. You call from tomorrow, you break ancient schemes. From the bondage of sorrow, the captives dream dreams. Our women see visions, our men clear their eyes. With bold new decisions, your people arise. Spirit. Spirit of gentleness, blow through the wilderness, calling and free. Spirit, spirit of restlessness, stir me from placidness, wind, wind on the sea. Our first reading today will be read by Sherry Brooks, who recorded this video just after she returned home from work at the hospital. Today's scripture reading comes from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 2 through 10. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow into salvation 
if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight, and like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable, acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, see, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. To you then who believe, he is precious. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner, and a stone that makes them stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous, marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Here and ends our scripture reading. reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 1 to 14. Let us listen for these words. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, you will may be also. And also you know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. May God's blessing be added to our understanding of these words. Amen. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. I always get a bit anxious whenever this passage comes up, and there's a very specific reason for that. When I first got to Moncton, I was doing a chapel service at People's Park Tower, and I was there with the St. John's United Church Men's Choir. Now, if you want to fill a chapel in Moncton, you bring the St. John's United Church Men's Choir. Eventually, they'd stop calling me and just kept calling them. I didn't take it too personally. So this one day I was there and, and uh, I was given my message and it was kind of in the spirit of things and I felt moved to say, does anybody have any questions? You've got a minister standing right here. And this woman stood up right away and she said, almost as if she was anticipating the question, what does it mean in the Bible when it says, in my father's house, there are many mansions. 
And I thought to myself, what have I done? <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't know the specific answer to that. So I did the very United Church thing by saying, what an excellent question. Let's give it to the group and ask them what they think. So I eventually got everybody else talking, took the spotlight off of me. And I think that uh, it's safe to say that a lot of clergy have imposter syndrome, where we think that perhaps we don't have all enough expertise to be doing what we're doing sometimes because we get called into these strange scenarios and we're terribly afraid of being exposed as frauds, which is why today we have my degrees sitting right behind my head. Give me a little bit of confidence to actually talk, to speak about being here. I was reading this book uh, by Anna Carter Florence, and it's called Preaching as Testimony. And I really love what she says in this book because it encourages preachers. It says really what our job is about is to make our people fall in love with the scriptures. Yeah, isn't that wonderful? To fall in love with the Bible. And to, to when you love something, it doesn't mean you have to agree with it all the time. It means that you, you can have discussions and go deep. And that's kind of where I feel like it's my role is to get people to go deeper with the, with the passages as opposed to just quoting them verbatim without seeing the multi-layers that are happening within the, within the texts. And I think she uh, nails it for me when she says that so often people are, are looking for expertise, but what we do when we met, help people to fall in love with the scripture is that the power of interpretation no longer resides with, with the preacher the power of interpretation now belongs with the people. So I can say my bit, and then everybody else has their own opinions and their brains and their hearts and their life experiences that help us to interpret these passages that were written then, but read today. I like that she talks about the, the point that when you have a broken sink, you call a plumber, or when you wanna get your taxes done, you bring them to an accountant or someone like that. Or as uh, one preacher put it, that when you need brain surgery, you want a brain surgeon to do it. So sometimes the expertise are, are really that important. And so I think that um, whenever I come to visit people in their homes, they think that I bring with them a certain, I bring with me a certain amount of interpretation ability that I've read the maps a little more. And I go visit people and I think, oh, well, I'm bringing the gospel to this house and, the, and prayer and I get there and, you know, more times than not, I'm just kind of there and while you're here, you might as well fix my television and put it on the wall. Or since you're here, would you mind taking a look at my computer? Great, no problem, I could do that. A another big one is getting me to take out the garbage. Since you're on your way out, would you mind? <laughs> I don't mind at all taking out the trash. Um, I remember once visiting a woman in Cape Breton who uh, she had to bake a pie for something and she said that her hands were too arthritic that day and her, her knees were too weak. So, you know, would you mind? And so I'd never baked a pie in my entire life. So I stood at the stove and we went through step by step how to do this. <laughs> uh, they told that story at her funeral. She said, this old bird isn't finished yet. So in that spirit of confidence, I thought I would go deeper into this passage that says in my father's house, there are many dwelling places, or in some texts it says mansions. I was looking at the New Jerusalem Bible, and here it says, chapter 14, verse 2, in my father's house, there are many places to live in. So lots of different ways to start looking at this. I went through some books, and I was thinking about uh, that could best find the answer for this. One of them was The Community of the Beloved Disciple by Raymond Brown, which is a really... Uh, amazing book on John's Gospel. And the other one was this tome, The Resurrection of the Son of God by N.T. Wright. And I think that's eventually where I found what I was looking for. And Tom Wright argues that uh, whenever Jesus said, my father's house, he was clearly referring to the temple. And the temple was the center of Jewish life. And so Jesus knew that. Everybody around Jesus knew what the temple was. It was this massive complex and in that complex uh, were many rooms and so 
in my father's house and temple, there are many rooms, and I go to go there to prepare a place for you. So they would have understood that what Jesus was talking about in this, what comes next after this life, that for them it was kind of a, um, another kind of temple. It was something that they knew. So if Jesus is talking about this temple, and, and in Jewish society the temple was so important because it was considered to be the place where heaven and earth met. And so I thought of to myself, where around here does heaven and earth meet? So it would be essentially, hold on, bear with me. It would be essentially saying, in Cape Breton, there are many beds, bed and breakfasts, and I go to prepare a room for you. Huh. You know, you get the point. The dwelling places, though, uh, in all seriousness, are safe places. They are the places where those who have died go to find lodging and rest, like pilgrims in the temple that Jesus knew. And I think that we have these images before us today, where we live in a world with words such as social distancing and self-quarantining, where we feel like we're stuck at home. And as one person said, it's more accurate to say that we're safe at home. We're in our dwelling places, we're safe, and I think of that now as I think of this passage. Sometimes when I'm with people who are grieving, whether it's in my office or in someone's home and we're sitting there over a cup of tea and we're talking and crying and praying and doing the things that you do, people wonder you know, where their loved one is and, and they often talk about it as they're in heaven. That's just, just how, it's, how it is and it's such a comforting thought to people. And Jesus talks about it. He says, you know, if you follow me, I'm going to be there. And I'm going to prepare a place for you. That is, if resurrection is the central core of our, of our Christian life, then why wouldn't we go to be with Jesus in this place that is surrounded with God's love? And when people talk about their images of heaven, I'm always intrigued to find out what heaven looks like for somebody. A woman said that for her, heaven was like a craft room with endless crafts. And someone else said in the eulogy for their uncle that um, when he died that, that heaven was, he was up there in heaven now singing karaoke. And I thought to myself, how thankful I am to be here on earth. <laughs> I'm joking, but if heaven is simply crafts and karaoke, then I'm going to have to start living a healthier life to stay here as long as I can. I'm just being funny. Um, I think also want to say that uh, when people are on their deathbed or when um, they're talking about heaven, that I often hear this language of reunion, that, that mom's gone to be with dad now, or that someone has, has gone to join with, with their loved ones. And I, I like that. I, you know, I, when I'm with someone who's dying, I often think that maybe there's a certain wisdom and in the twilight that between heaven and earth where they meet in that moment and I say to them what, what's this like for you what's what's happening and what do you think is going to happen and reunion is is nine times out of ten the theme that I hear for that I'll never forget this little girl in a funeral home when I was talking to her and her mom and her baby brother had just been killed in a car accident and I had been talking with the family and by now they were pretty comfortable with me and the little girl knew me and she handed me this piece of paper and on the piece of paper was this, uh, this uh, image of her and her family and they're all holding hands and it's her mom and her baby brother and all their hearts are going up in the sky and uh, uh, I said what's going on in the picture and she said oh that, that's our love going to be with them and they're going to feel that love and you know it's just this this concept of, of, of reunion that that I love so much. I think that as believers, Jesus knows that our hearts are troubled. I think that Jesus knows that our churches are filled with troubled hearts, that Christianity somehow doesn't make us exempt from pain, that accidents happen, that world pandemics happen, and that even now as we're troubled by what we're seeing and we're feeling the troubled hearts because the people who are going to be most affected by this are the poor who are already struggling to live 
And the places of pain in our world that already needed our help are now going to be even more so in pain. And, and, dis, and uh, it's, it's so heartbreaking. And that's why I think we have to keep doing things as the church to help our, our hurting world. And I also, you know, we're also troubled by, by the other stuff in life, the troubled relationships. We have instability in our lives with employment. We have our health that might not be uh, where we want it right now. Um, what do we do with that? What do we do with our troubled hearts? And Jesus speaks directly to that. And I don't know if this is easy to do or not, but this is what he says. He says to our troubled hearts, believe in God, believe also in me. And I don't think it fixes things. I think it gives us this holy pause, though, this exhale. And that when we are feeling the broken heart and we are walking on the edge of this life, that he comes to us and says, believe in God. It's not easy now, but maybe your belief will sustain you through some other things. I need that. And I need the people in my life who are the edge walkers, the people who come to the edge with me and, and look over and see all the bad things and say, yeah, it is bad. And then they walk me back. And we can be that for each other. I think we can, we can find those people in our lives. And for me in this text, Jesus is one of those people. That when you look into the void and you're seeing the pain and the pandemics, he says, believe in God. And I, so what does that mean? And I think that what that means is that uh, we believe in the action of God. We, Jesus says, even if you can't believe in that, then believe in the works that you're seeing being done in my name, that when people are giving their time and their talent and their treasure to the pain of this world and our belief in the goodness of people, because far too often we see what happens with our friends and with our family and sometimes ourselves when we start to believe in the evil that's being done and the division and the conspiracy theories and the blaming, that that can't be of God. But what is of God? is belief, belief in goodness, in love. And that's uh, the message of Jesus in this passage. He's saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Especially when we're feeling short on those things right now, those are indeed words of good news. I remember we had an old friend of this church by the name of Milton Palmer. Milton was a banker here in Moncton, and he was a gentleman, just a lovely soul that we were all privileged to know. And despite all of his success, his success in life, um, Milton kept this passage in his pocket that he'd found. And it was he wrote it in his own handwriting. And so I, I actually have a copy of that because it makes me think of him. And it's a beautiful way, I think, to end our time in, together like this. It's written by Stephen Grellett. And it says, I'm going to read um, from Milton's words. I shall pass through this world but once. Any good, therefore, that I can do, or any kindness that I can show to any human being, let me do it now. Let me not deter or neglect it, for I shall not pass this way again. May God be with you all. Let us pray. Be with us through all the unknown days lying before us. Days when where the flowers bloom and trees bud, but every day feels like the day before. Days when the headlines seem to emerge from the worst dystopian reality. But we remind ourselves again that this is the new normal. Days when we are consumed with worry for the vulnerable, the poor, and the sick. But we do not know what to do with our troubled hearts. Be with us in this unknown, O oh God. Do not put us to shame. Be our refuge and strength, so that we grow in union with all our sisters and brothers, so that we may see more deeply into ourselves. 
Be with us in this unknown, O God. Show your full self to us and allow us to see ourselves in you. Resist the temptation to show great works, but remind us where you dwell. Show us your heartbeat. Let us feel your breath as close as our own. Help us to find the faith to believe. I am in you and you are in me. Help us to understand that for those who are faithful to you, life is not ended but only changed. Help us to join together with all you have created to say, great and powerful is our God. God fills heaven and earth with love and beauty. It is a beauty we see in doctors, nurses, chaplains, grocery workers, and delivery workers. It is love that we see smiling in the eyes above each face mask. Even in the unknown, O oh God, we believe in you. Help us to believe in each other and even ourselves. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And we continue to pray in the name of the one who taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I want to thank all of you for joining us in this service. Thank you to our singers and our scripture reader and for everyone who is supporting St. John's during this difficult time. Thank you for caring for one another. It makes me proud to belong to this church. Following the benediction, we will have the hymn, Come to Our Hearts, Lord Jesus. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit Go with each and every one of you, this day and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>